Very often when we hear the word resilience, the typical response is bounce back. In one of my podcast conversations with Bruce Feiler, who's written the book Life is in the Transitions, he uses the word shape-shifting to say resilience is not just about bouncing back to the old normal, it's often about shape-shifting to the new normal. A great exemplar for this is my next guest, Sucharita Mukherjee. Her initial years were quite predictable. LSR, I am Ahmedabad, Deutsche Bank London, Morgan Stanley London and so on. But when she faced a significant personal upheaval in 2008, she came back to India and joined IFMR and was the first CEO of IFMR Capital. IFMR Capital subsequently became Northern Arc, which went IPO recently. She is now the CEO and co-founder of Kaleidofin, a fintech which makes affordable finance possible for millions of Indians. Her journey is a great example of how we need to rediscover our flavor as we go through a journey, something I discuss in my book. Pay particular attention to how she's gone on an inner journey over time and how she juggles her multiple responsibilities, including three startups, one being Kaleido Finn and two being two young daughters that she's raising. Without further ado, let's dive into the conversation with Sucharita Mukherjee. So Charita, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come on this uh, series about uh, playing to potential. No, thanks so much, Deepak. Lovely to be here. Uh, maybe just to give uh, context to the listeners and uh, people who are tuning in, uh, it'll be lovely if you can talk a little bit about uh, yourself uh, as it stands today, what you do professionally and a little bit around your family, and then I'd love to uh, go back to the past. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so uh, I run a fintech uh, called Kaleidofin. Our uh, target segment customer is uh, a woman entrepreneur. Um, uh, we're giving uh, the woman means to fulfill her business goals, her family's goals by using finance as a really important tool uh, to empower her and we believe the entire family uh, as well. So uh, we are a B2B2C platform and uh, we essentially reach out to our customers through many channels uh, like microfinance institutions, cooperatives, and essentially connect you know, the large banks, mutual funds, um, uh, lenders uh, to uh, this very, very important customer base. Got it. Got it. And when you say women are the primary focus, or are they or uh, they are the only customers? You don't have men as your customers, just to clarify. No, we do have uh, men as our customers as well. Uh, but uh, but we do design our products uh, and their features, uh, for example, confidentiality um, or even assistance. Um, uh, more local language support, voice support, etc., which we found through market research is much more required to get people on to that financial journey. Um, uh, we do design specially for women, but we do have male customers as well. Got it. Got it. And in general, I would say the focus is on uh, the informal customer segment, which is about 90% of India hmm. today. And do you want to define that when you say informal uh, is, there a, is there a certain definition to the uh, informal sector? Yeah, yeah. So informal really is anybody who doesn't have a pay slip, anybody mm. um, uh, you know who is largely you know not paying taxes, uh, doesn't have documentation to support their income. Mm. Um, and India is a country of you know forced entrepreneurship in a way mm. because there are only very few formal jobs available. Uh, jobs um, uh, where you get paid a salary and you're part of a larger company. Um, only seven to eight uh, percent of India really works in that formal segment. We tend to think that that's sort of the universe because those are the people we interact with. But uh, the reality is that ninety percent of Indians, you know, are running small stores. Have uh, you know are have push cards, are running small garages, just a variety of small businesses, um, hmm. uh, you know, that that really need um, 
uh, access to finance. Got it. Got it. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your family? Uh, given we are trying to understand people as a, as a complete human being, maybe you just sort of share a little bit about what, what does your family look like today? And then maybe we can go back to the formative years. Yes, yes. So, um, so overall, uh, you know, uh, I have two girls, so they're 11 and 13 years old. Uh, I have a husband, he's uh, an academic and a mathematician, also musician. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I have a brother, an older brother who's in the army, um, uh, you know, fortunate to have uh, both my parents and in-laws uh, and uh, you know we live in the same city as my in-laws uh, so you know just get a ton of support from there got it lovely so Charita, let's go back uh, let's rewind the clock you come from a foggy background and i've uh, given the choices i've made i have a little bit of a window into a foggy life and a foggy childhood but uh, I, I find it interesting to understand how people are shaped in their early years and I also, I think in some of your other conversations, you've spoken about how maybe this element of maybe making a difference or purpose uh, sort of showed up in different shapes and forms. But but curious about, uh, you know, growing up, are there uh, things you would say helped shape you, uh, shape you rather, uh, your, let's say, your operating system, if you will? Yes. <clears throat> no, I think uh, that, uh, you know, my brother and I were just so lucky to have uh, the childhood uh, that we did very safe um, in a community that was deeply bonded mm -hmm. uh, uh, together. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and also, um, you know, had that deep sense of respect for, uh, for a purpose that's larger than yourself. And now that purpose might be completely different things for different people. Mm -hmm. Like for, uh, uh, you know, my father, um, uh, you know, it might have been, you know, serving in the army and to put uh, sort of uh, your soldiers before yourself. Um, uh, for me, it uh, it's our mission uh, and serving our customers. Uh, but I think that uh, deep respect for that quality um, uh, and which is, I mean, I feel like this is the best thing about human beings, uh, that we are able to look beyond ourselves. We are, I mean, also, we are also capable of being extraordinarily selfish. But, but uh, on the other hand, we are also capable mm. of uh, very, very brave and noble actions. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and that is sort of the fantastic thing uh, about being human um, and uh, you know I think that the our upbringing was um, was very wide our parents made sure that you know we were exposed I don't think there was any pressure first of mm. all mm. I think to do um, uh, you know to pressure to uh, you know be excellent uh, uh, in any way, uh, I think our, you know, my parents just let me be. Uh, I remember at one point, uh, I thought, uh, largely because of peer pressure that I would prepare for engineering. And then, uh, I did a course for two, three months and decided that I just, you know, didn't enjoy it at all and decided to, you know, told my parents that I don't want to do it. Um, and they said, okay, you know, there was, there was no discussion uh, about it because I think, you know, it fundamentally came from a trust uh, in me, mm. uh, which was, which was very nice because you also feel like repaying that trust, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right? Because I was trusted at one mm. point um, and uh, my parents could have made me feel very guilty, but mm. uh, because everybody was doing it. And, uh, you know, I was one of the few, uh, I thought, you know, it just, it feels like uh, I want to spend three years in 
<clears throat> you know, in a liberal arts sort of setting, I want to experience many mm. things. Uh, and that's the experience I'm looking for. Uh, not that you know very much at that age, but uh, but still, it's uh, it's what I wanted. It's what was aspirational for me, mm. um, uh, you know, at that point. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it was an extremely supportive uh, mm. environment. Uh, my parents were also very, very particular to expose us to music, art, culture, museums, which, um, uh, you know, which loosely links into purpose. Mm. But I think just that exposure, uh, you know, makes you realize that, um, uh, that there are things other than, you know, just pursuing uh, maximization of money. Mm. Uh, I think it's much bigger know, than you, right? I think just uh, it's when much you do the bigger work. than you. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. So, so I think, uh, and of course, my mother was always working, mm. uh, and so I always saw her uh, work from a very young age, and mm. uh, uh, you know, juggle um, teaching uh, with raising us, and and therefore, you know, both sets of parents had to be pretty involved. Mm. Um, and uh, and I think that was a good dynamic because you learn right mm. from the templates uh, that your parents set up for you. Mm. Uh, uh, so um, and while of course it was a different generation, so uh, it's not like how it is today. But still, I think I saw some of that give and take mm. uh, uh, happen. Uh, I saw my you know my father was much better at making the result sheets, mm. which is enormous, you know charts in which every single person and you know uh, uh, we would all pitch in mm. uh, and uh, uh, so yeah I mean I think we had access to sports facilities mm. um, uh, so overall it was a very very enriching uh, childhood um, I think it made me believe that I can be whoever I want to be I think we need that sort of confidence. Also, I think uh, just uh, thinking aloud, at least what I've I've learned through some of my ex conversations as well is it uh, builds the muscle of decision making, right? When sometimes when people are asked to choose, then yeah. A, it makes you responsible, like you rightly said. And B, also it sort of gets you to start thinking about trade-offs, choices, listening to your heart, what do I want? And then just that... Uh, muscle of decision making often gets sharpened as well I've noticed when when that's sort of made available early on true true um, uh, you know so true uh, you know we uh, sort of grew up in a time where job opportunities were not obvious mm. uh, and uh, especially not after uh, you know doing an undergrad at uh, Delhi University I was at Lady Shiram it was one of the best colleges but it didn't guarantee you a job Mm, uh, at mm. all. So it was something that was playing at the back of my mind to say that, look, you know, you have to be financially independent and and what is the path mm. to that? Mm. Uh, clearly, you know, I can't just keep living at home. Um, and I was actually at home right up until my undergraduate years. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that didn't seem like a great equilibrium to continue. <laughs> You know, in the 20s, uh, seem, already seemed a bit late, uh, you know, compared to many of my classmates. But uh, but clearly, you know, at some point of time, you uh, you do become responsible and say that, okay, um, mm -hmm. uh, I have to do what I need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and just moving forward, right, I think, uh, I think there's this episode of you getting into Irma and then IMA yeah. and finding your co-founder at uh, Irma, I'm yes. guessing, right, uh, Puneet. Yes. Uh, the other piece that struck me when I was sort of reading up one of your, uh, I think, articles was just that at the end of IMA or during the internship, you 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 and a group of others set up a social impact uh, venture or consulting firm of sorts, uh, and then you joined uh, Deutsche Bank. So I'd love I'd love for you to talk a little bit about maybe what was brewing in your head. Uh, just maybe through this passage of play. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so the years at LSR were actually deeply formative. 
uh, again, largely because of the kind of exposure we were given. Um, and uh, right from, uh, uh, you know, Arundhati Roy to the, the Lai Lama um, and Amartya Sen, we were exposed to, you know, the greatest thinkers, writers, uh, philosophers of our time. And uh, uh, and again, you know, that sense of, okay, there is something actually that's much bigger than me that got reinforced during my undergraduate years. Um, and uh, and we were actually also uh, pretty much forced to do social work. And uh, I remember being one of the people who was very flippant uh, mm. about uh, doing social work um, as part and of the college uh, curriculum. As part of the college curriculum. And it's because I didn't know any better. Uh, mm. And, uh, you know, I thought it was a waste of time and almost feel ashamed of, uh, you know, how I reacted initially. Mm. Uh, but then, you know, we were told that, okay, you know, if you want to stay in the college, then you have to do this. So did mm. it grudgingly mm. at first. But then when, um, uh, you know, I got exposed to it, um, it was just like a whole new world uh, opening itself. And at a very sort of formative age, uh, mm. those sort of years of 18 to 20, those are, uh, you know, that's the time when you're thinking of who am I, what do I want to do? And clearly this seemed hugely valuable. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and I learned a lot um, from that process. And I'm I'm just so happy that they, it was compulsory because mm. I would have never done it if it wasn't. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, you know, and so some of these experiences led me to think that, okay, you know, I definitely want to go to a place which, um, uh, you, you know, which gives me financial independence, which gives me sort of a good career. Um, uh, but I also ideally want to, uh, you know, work in a place, uh, where I can impact, mm. uh, uh, you know, people who don't have as much uh, as us or who are not as privileged as us. And with that thought, I applied to Irma. Um, uh, among, among the other, you know, I had only applied to a few, um, uh, but uh, Irma was among my top choices because of the field uh, in which they operated. Rural management seemed um, very aligned uh, mm. to my goals. Uh, and uh, and so I, I actually, because their course actually starts earlier um, and the results come out earlier, I had actually al already gone there uh, and I was really enjoying it. Uh, and, I met, and just to pause there, I'm yeah. guessing, uh, is it fair to say that among the various LSR, let's say your classmates, uh, Irma wasn't, is not sort of the natural choice, right? I, I guess you might have been one of the few. Is it fair to say you were one of the few that applied to Irma and Gordon, or was it sort of a no, choice? No, it, was, it wasn't a very popular choice. Mm. Um, mm. As, you know, uh, it was, everybody knew Irma was a very tough course with a lot of field work. You had to stay, mm. um, uh, you know, in villages with, uh, you know, very few amenities for, pro for you know, months uh, mm. together. But, uh, and even though, you know, at that point, I had never, ever stayed in a village before. I mean, uh, you have seen army cantonments and, of course. Um, uh, you know, I'd had a very protected childhood, actually. Uh, so it was not like it was familiar to me at all. Mm. Mm. But, but I like the idea mm. of, of doing something like this. So, uh, I mean, very few people would have applied. Mm. And uh, yeah, in fact, I mean, some of my cousins uh, thought it was really bad idea uh, to apply because uh, they knew of people who had, who were not able to, you know, go through the rigor uh, mm. of the program, didn't enjoy it at all. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, there were several people dissuading me uh, for sure, but, Somehow it just felt right. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I may share, I mean, Kamini, who you know well, 
Uh, she talks about her stint in Chamarajnagar after her social work when she was working in Karnataka and Chamarajnagar. She says it, it's it's a it's quite different from an army cantonment, right? Just in terms of where you get your yeah. food, the quality of the amenities, the home you live in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, got it. Irma, yeah, Irma happened. So Irma was a very short stint, just a couple of weeks, uh, but we practically spent uh, you know eighty percent of that time in a. Uh, doing a field visit to a small village. Uh, uh, you know, I remember it clear as day, even today, uh, because it left a very, very deep impression. Uh, we were sort of three girls uh, who were sent away to a pretty remote village, actually. It didn't even have a road uh, mm -hmm. uh, connecting the village. It had like five kilometers of dirt track. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, you know, and uh, again, you know, my parents did not weigh in. Um, they just, uh, you know, I hope I can be the same, you know, to my children. <laughs> but that's a different uh, podcast I, conversation. <laughs> but when I think about it, when I think about it, uh, uh, you know, it's not that easy uh, mm. to to let go uh, like this and. Um, um, we uh, we stayed there. We were supposed to research uh, the components of uh, the village economy and the social systems uh, prevailing uh, there. And uh, uh, it was just uh, mind-blowing, uh, mm -hmm. honestly. It was very tough um, uh, uh, because we were not used to it. But uh, I think, you know, at points in your life, you go through accelerated learning. Um, and in a period of, you know, 10 days, we learned way more than we would have in months and months, maybe even years. Hmm. Uh, and I think more importantly, you also develop empathy. Hmm. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you realize that everybody is, you know, doing the best they can is, um, is pretty smart, given... Hmm. Uh, the resources they have available. Um, you learn not to be condescending uh, as well um, because they're doing probably a much better job than you would have because they know more mm. uh, than you. Uh, you can see men working, women working, uh, uh, you know, uh, throughout the day, working mm. so hard. Uh, so to uh, for their families essentially and for their businesses but ultimately for their families um, and uh, uh, it was the, it was a very beautiful experience um, and uh, you know there was lots of drama <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but also I think one of the uh, uh, Wonderful things that happened in Irma was that I actually met two of my co-founders. One is Bindu, uh, who was a co-founder at IFMR, and the other is Puneet, who was a co-founder with me at Kaleidofin. Wow. And um, it's it's not like we we uh, we had a bond back mm. then. Weeks mm. was just too short. Um, but I think we knew we cared about the same things. Hmm. Uh, and that's why we were there. Uh, and, you know, I actually got to know them much later uh, hmm. when I met them again. Uh, but but I guess it wasn't a surprise that our paths crossed again. Uh, because, uh, you know, at that point, then I got admission into IMA. Uh, and, uh, Wait, it's uh, number one, uh, right? If I remember right. I remember you saying. Yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. God. Uh, exactly. So, uh, and, you know, I was, I was trying not to think uh, about what would happen because I'd settled in beautifully. Uh, do they give you a letter? I mean, I, uh, do they tell you that uh, you're waitlisted and there's a chance that you might yes, make it so yes, your options yes. open? Okay. Yes, yes, you do. Okay. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and I think I wasn't thinking about it the moment I had, hmm. I came to Irma, I wasn't thinking so much about it because I was really enjoying it. Mm. So I thought that, okay, you know, go to, uh, you know, like, comes. Haan, correct. Haan, haan. let's not deal with it at this point of time. Abhi, 
I'm enjoying this experience and I love it. So, uh, you know, I was very happy with where I was, um, uh, you know, but my parents called and said that, okay, this letter is here. And, uh, and again, um, they of course assumed that I would choose um, IMA, but uh, I think what they had not anticipated was the degree of angst it would cause, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, inside me. So, which was very visible, um, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, when I was talking to them and when, you know, when my father finally came to help me move mm -hmm. uh, from, I mean, within Gujarat from Anand to Ahmedabad, it was just a short drive. Uh, over but uh, uh, you know I remember them you know again taking the pressure off to say that okay you know what you do whatever you want you clearly seem to be very upset about mm -hmm. leaving this place so uh, it's fine it doesn't mm -hmm. matter uh, mm -hmm. and just do what you want but uh, you know I myself felt a lot of pressure mm -hmm. um, and I felt like I might be missing out this opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, to just be with some of the best people. Hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, and I might never know what that felt like. Maybe I would regret it. Uh, so I went because on the back of these emotions hmm. uh, to say, uh, um, uh, you know, I didn't go wholeheartedly. <laughs> I in a sense. So I wasn't just like, oh, wow, great. I got into IMA. Fantastic. Let's go. That wasn't my emotion at all. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and I remember uh, when my father came over to, uh, you know, help me pack up and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, I just howled, uh, you know, when I left. Uh, mm. Uh, in you know in a way that I, I even surprised myself uh, I had no idea I was going to feel like that and mm. uh, my father was a bit uh, sort of <laughs> taken aback and was you know trying to figure out uh, what to do uh, but uh, uh, but but I was still clear that I did want to go uh, yeah. even though with a heavy heart so I, I left with a heavy heart Right. And I thought that the, it was the right call. It was sort of like a mind decision. Hmm. Rationally, hmm. Um, I figured that this is uh, this is a good experience. I might regret it later. And therefore, I went. Uh, but I had a lot of regret, um, hmm. uh, you know, when I left. So it was an interesting sort of way to, uh, to come to IMA. Uh, Got it. Got it. Uh, and, also maybe because of the yeah. the sequence of events right had had, right. Uh, had you not spent the two weeks maybe the emotional attachment might have been lower but the fact that you immersed yourself and then this came through right. I guess that that makes it a little harder I guess yes 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 and uh, and it's surprising to see how how fast you can hmm. form bonds hmm. um, uh, you know or uh, uh, you know, uh, just in a sense, when when something resonates fully mm. uh, uh, with the conception of who you are, uh, I think it's just that much harder. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so it was interesting, but I think life is about hard choices, and it was, I guess, my first hard choice. Mm. Uh, mm. Probably my first hard choice mm. uh, in my life. Uh, I didn't have that many choices <laughs> to make before that. Hmm. Uh, and it's interesting for as you rightly say for a lot of people including me IMA is never seen as a hard choice for me actually uh, it was actually going for a master's in the US or IMA so from that perspective it was a hard choice but uh, for I guess yeah what is a hard choice is contextual uh, I hear you and then fast forwarding Sucharita IMA um, uh, maybe if, if I may in the, in the interest of time IMA I think Deutsche Bank um, I think I'm curious about I think Deutsche, Deutsche Bank to IFMR. I think uh, again it's a it's a it's a nonlinear transition, right? Can you talk a little bit about uh, that passage of play? Yeah, no, definitely. I think uh, um, uh, Deutsche Bank was um, 
was honestly a great place to learn uh, a lot. Uh, worked with uh, very smart people, um, and uh, you know, however, the culture of the place, um, and I would say investment banks in general. Mm. I don't think one is that different from the other. Um, really bothered me, um, mm. and. Uh, uh i didn't uh, find myself thinking that uh, okay i i look up to my boss or my boss's boss or anybody um not because they weren't smart they were actually exceptionally smart uh but uh i think our value systems just didn't align uh and uh, and when you are quite junior uh, it doesn't come up but as you spend a little bit of time that friction starts to show up and and i was feeling that uh, that sense of emptiness um that i was going through the motions um everybody thought that i was doing uh, a great job i was in a great position but somehow i just didn't think that myself mm. um and uh, um i think that was coupled with so i i feel like you know those feelings might have simmered under the surface for a very long time but what precipitated that non linear move was uh, you know a very deep uh, personal crisis that i went through a uh, very serious relationship ended uh, around that time and uh, um and suddenly uh you know i realized that uh, that void uh, was just um uh, intolerable uh, in a way um and uh, i didn't it's somehow like you know i think i guess if you have an anchor in your life even if work is like 50% of what it should be or 40% it's still all right Hmm. uh but when you take that anchor away <laughs> and uh, then you're you know left with this 40 50% then you're thinking okay what am i doing hmm. uh with my life uh, i'm uh, my personal life has just come crashing down uh work is also uh, you know i'm not happy with what i do at work uh so why exactly am i doing what i'm doing so i think all of those thoughts um uh you know came together and uh and what i did actually around this time was just explore mm -hmm. um uh, so i'm uh i'd love for I you just, to expand on yeah. that because in a way yeah. i'm curious about uh, there were many pathways you could have chosen right i'm curious about just that let's say moving on from that phase of life and you decided to move out of london as well uh, at that time yes so i'd love for you to maybe talk a little bit about uh, just that exploration what all how long where all did you look uh, yeah um so it was long actually i think almost uh, you know 2 to 3 years mm -hmm. um and uh, you know there wasn't a single eureka moment uh, i uh, i wanted to know what it felt like to be doing something impactful so i wanted to meet as many people as mm -hmm. i could in in india in london who uh, at least in my opinion mm -hmm. were doing something i respect so uh, you know i met uh, uh, entrepreneurs in the field of primary education healthcare um in india uh, in india yeah mm -hmm. so whenever i would visit um uh, at that point again my parents were like okay do whatever you feel like do what makes you happy so this was you while know? keeping the role in banking or was it yes. uh, okay okay yes while keeping the role uh, in banking um so primarily uh, you know i would probably have a month off in a year okay, okay. i would spend almost that entire month uh, you know rather than uh, just go home um or go for a wedding or whatever you know do the usual things i would uh, go and spend time uh, with a few ngos with a few entrepreneurs and you know you realize that there are just so many people out there 
uh, who are happy to welcome you mm-hmm. and spend time with you if you have the time mm-hmm. to spend with them sincerely. Uh, mm-hmm. So I was surprised at how many, you know, how many doors opened without mm-hmm. knowing anyone uh, at all. So uh, so that was very nice because uh, you know I didn't expect uh, that that would happen. Uh, and I thought that, okay, you know, if I was in banking, nobody would make time for a person mm. like this. But um, but now that I'm not clearly, uh, there are people who see value mm. in, uh, in, in just spending time literally educating, um, mm. uh, you know, another person who just as of now has a desire for impact, uh, but doesn't quite know what she's doing. Uh, and so, at that stage, if, if I may, uh, were you clear that you were trying to, if I may, move out of the capitalist world to yeah. the impact world? W- was that choice made or were you also evaluating, if I may, sort of the traditional financial services kind of pathways after a banking uh, role? No, I wasn't evaluating traditional financial services pathways at all. Okay. I think I evaluated uh, academics briefly. Mm. Um uh, I thought uh, I, I thought to myself that maybe I needed to learn some more hmm. uh, before making a switch. Um, uh, but I think the choice was made in the subconscious. Hmm. Um, I think the conscious realization that I wanted this took a little bit of time, hmm. but I didn't meet anyone. Interesting. You know, Interesting. in the financial services domain in India, outside, anywhere. I mean, uh, so I guess, you know, your actions speak louder than your words. And maybe I might myself may not have realized uh, Mm. that my desire for impact uh, was that big, but uh, I think it reflected itself in uh, my actions. So uh, so I I just learned so much. Mm. Uh, I met a few social entrepreneurs also in London um and uh, and briefly there was uh you know a choice of uh should i pursue impact while staying here mm-hmm. um uh you know in london but then i felt that again how i felt uh mm-hmm. in india was just different it was um uh you know that it it was important to me um uh, the place was important to me the people are important to me um, mm. I guess maybe I don't know attributed to my army upbringing <laughs> you know there was some sense of patriotism mixed with the uh, uh, impact uh, but because there were those two choices as well mm. so I did I did think about that and uh, but I was largely going with my gut and how I felt um, it's interesting if I go back to the IMA versus Irma decision you're speaking about the head versus heart and even this there's a little more of leaning into the heart than the yes. head over time. I mean, even when I look back, I think initially there's a little bit of rationality, but over time you start trusting your gut and sort of leaning into that a little bit more as, as correct. you sort of progress. Correct, and correct. So that's interesting so, as well. Yeah, so it was just over a period of time mm. uh, that, uh, uh, you know, I happened to meet um, uh, Nachiket and Bindu mm. uh, and Puneet, uh, mm. all of whom were looking to you know, make markets work for the underprivileged, for the poor. And uh, that really resonated because I felt like my skills mm. and my, uh, you know, desire to make an impact were finally coming together. And, uh, uh, you know, it was very obvious that it was the right place mm-hmm. uh, when it happened. So it, it took... Uh, two and a half years but within I think within three months of meeting uh, all of them I was back in India Mm. so it was a pretty quick decision once uh, you know the meeting of minds uh, happened and and it was only after that that I got to know my Mm. co-founders interesting and and it's I mean it seems quick but I guess you've been exploring in your head for a while, yes. right? In a way yes. that that uh, it's uh, things often seem quick, but they've they've often been brewing for a while in the in the, in the background. Uh, correct, correct, correct. Got it, got it. And then, yeah, but I'd love to come to the personal side in a couple of minutes. But maybe 
just to maybe uh, fast forward this thread, uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the transition from IFMR to Kaleidofin as well. Because I remember one of our earlier conversations where I distinctly remember you talking about the kind of organization that you like to lead and what gives you joy. And in a way, I uh, Kaleidofin has turned out to be that, right? When I go back to what you said uh, yes. a few years back, I'd love for you to maybe talk a little bit about that transition as well. Yes. Um, so uh, I think uh, some of uh, the genesis behind Kaleidofin uh, lied in uh, just us appreciating the fact that if we just keep building branches one at a time, uh, then the path to the mission is just very slow. Uh, and it takes a lot of resource. And uh, uh, at that point of time, at least the promise of being able to reach the customer uh, in a digital way with Aadhaar, leveraging the India stack, the promise was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the two came together, uh, I thought to myself that uh, there could be a better, uh, you know, a different scalable way uh, of really leveraging tech and data science um, to uh, empower customers, empower institutions as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, fundamentally a lot of these institutions uh, don't have uh, the tech and data science capabilities uh, that they need to in order to be providing better financial products to their customers. Uh, so I think part of it was very much head uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, you know part of it was uh, around um, I feel like uh, I'm at my best when I'm building a new mm -hmm. um, when I'm taking uh, you know an idea from zero to hundred uh, and uh, you know working with smallish teams um, uh, knowing everybody um, and in my head, that was sort of the sweet spot. Uh, and I felt like a light of it, just given the way we were envisioning it as a tech data science uh, hub, could mm. be that. It's, mm. uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't need to scale linearly mm. Um, mm. Uh, to the number of customers or the amount of portfolio. You, it could be an organization that, even when we are impacting uh, 100 million people, could still be fairly small. Uh, and, uh, you know, it lends itself better. Uh, mm. When you're running a branch operation, you you cannot. It's a services, uh, right? services play to a product play, right? Which is a very different Correct. business model and a very different uh, people's model. Right? Hmm. Correct. So, uh, and of course, you know, the thrill of just learning a new domain. Hmm. Mm. Uh, both tech and data science uh, were completely new domains um, uh, to me. Um, and that learning journey was just incredible. That, you know, what I knew was finance and what I knew was, you know, structuring and capital markets, um, uh, you know, and also retail finance mm. um, uh, as well, uh, especially in rural areas. But this was a whole new world. Uh, you know, it, it felt very uncomfortable uh, at first. And we had to, uh, you know, put together the right team so that mm. uh, we could learn from each other. Uh, but that was very exciting. And, uh, um, and, I, and we are still on that journey. Uh, but I feel by and large, uh, uh, that product approach has worked. Hmm. Um, uh, to create a ton of impact. Uh, we could have not imagined that a product like Kaiscore will make like $2 billion of funding uh, available to, um, you know, small entrepreneurs. Wow. Uh, but, and it's not possible to do if you're not using a product hmm. uh, frame. Uh, hmm. It's just impossible, uh, almost impossible to pull off. Uh, so, uh, 
you know, so I think just the amount of uh, even personal learning that I've got uh, from this journey, I'm very, very thankful for. And of course, uh, just uh, I think it's great to put yourself outside your comfort zone. I think when you're starting to get very comfortable is the point uh, at which uh, you probably need to look for something new. Um, I mean, I'm glad to say that, uh, you know, I'm still not in my comfort zone. <laughs> yeah. Really lovely. Yeah. So... Lovely. Uh, <laughs> uh, lovely. Uh, just going back, uh, Sucharita, I wanted to explore some of the other dimensions, right? Uh, I remember when you were taken on charge at IFMR, um, that was around the time you had your two daughters, right? Uh, yes. You you uh, you had a couple of uh, maternity transitions. Given you had the two daughters, I'm curious about how you thought about choices. Uh, uh, you know, very often in my limited uh, empirical observation, that's around the time a lot of women, uh, in a way, choose family over career, and in a way, they see it as a binary choice. But I I noticed that you've sort of uh, straddle the two well and and entrepreneurship is a is an intense pursuit right it's not that you know you had uh, two daughters and you settled for something in a way you're building you you moved from IFMR to Kaleidofin all this is sort of reasonably intense so can you talk a little bit about how you thought about choices but also uh, maybe what enabled that uh, maybe there's a certain family context uh, support etc so I'd love for you to maybe d discuss that a bit yes um, so uh, when I had uh, Anandana had Vasundara, uh, our first daughter, um, there was a point at which uh, I wasn't very clear about mm. the way forward. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I had even taken maternity leave without an end date as mm. such. I had not communicated an end date. Um, and, uh, and it was because I was not clear uh, mm. about uh, what lied ahead because I had no idea mm. uh, what this would entail. And uh, uh, and Vasudra was, you know, I'm sure it was very special to both of us. And, um, and therefore, uh, at that point, I think what really helped was just the support mm. of other women um around me um and i'll uh, you know one was bindu who um sort of just gave me the belief uh that it's going to work and we're going to make it work no matter what mm. uh, because i felt like i was not in a position to make any promises mm. uh around my work times uh how often I would be available for travel, um, just basic things. And this is pre-COVID, right? Pre-flexible mm. work and all of that. So you also know that people are watching you and judging mm. you for, uh, you know, leaving mm. work early. Uh, mm. And what does it look like when you're the CEO? Mm. Um, so all of these things were playing and I didn't want to do a job halfway through. You know, I... So... You know, th that was really weighing in on me because I felt like, okay, if I can't do it well, then I may as well not do it at all. Hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, but Bindu would hold team meetings at my house. Hmm. Uh, you know, she would make sure I was involved in every single strategic decision. And, you know, Vasundra has like literally been there, <laughs> you know, on my lap, <laughs> you know, for a lot of these meetings. And uh, uh, and also, I'd like to actually, I remember Dave, who was also one of the co-founders yes. at IFMR. Yes. Two, three years ago, he uh, he was a very hands-on uh, father. Hmm. And he would bring his son Cyrus along. And hmm. at that point, I didn't have, uh, you know, any children. But, but he did it. So he made it okay. You Fascinating. Know? Um, and uh, so Bindu, I think, played a huge role. And at some point of time, she was just like, okay, we're going to make it work and you're coming back, you know, mm. on such and such date. And just that utter confidence, 
in me was was important for me mm. to you know give it my 100% um as well uh, and i think it's very rare uh, the other person was shama who mm. was at ifmar capital at the time and who was uh, just a wonderful leader mm. um and uh, and and she just held the fort mm. um and uh, she traveled when i couldn't she just sort of uh, stood by me uh, mm. throughout um and i would say these you know these two women made it possible uh, mm. for me uh, to come back uh and uh, yeah I, i'm i'm not sure what it would be like uh, without them i always feel like uh, you know i've been fortunate to find uh, just these people in my life who made things possible uh when otherwise you would think otherwise by the time i had gitanjali i was very clear that mm. i wanted to get work i knew it was possible uh, mm. as well and then i think at that point uh you know infrastructure also made it possible mm. so uh you know just uh, by uh, actually i had another friend who had just opened a day care mm-hmm. uh and uh, i you know i felt like and her child was going there mm. so i thought that okay you know if if her child is going there then you know so geeta actually joined day care at 9 uh, months mm-hmm. and uh, uh you know i started started work with that uh, sort of uh, backup and of course uh, you know throughout the period uh, uh, you know my in-laws uh, anand uh, my husband were just um, like breaks uh, mm. you know they were fully involved uh, vasundra was the first grandchild in the family so in a sense you know uh, I, i there were many many people mm. you know who were uh, and who were volunteering to take care and uh, and i think i just took it all i said yes to everyone <laughs> got it <laughs> oh, got it yeah i think you're right the environment and, and the environment yeah. plays such a big role right i think you need yes. to uh, to sort of ensure that you have that uh, backup uh yeah. when when you lead this life uh got it got it um i think uh moving to a different theme sucharita i think uh, one of the things i i talk about uh in the book as well as about having space for what you truly love <clears throat> right i think uh, some people are lucky they're able to find what they love in what they do as as a profession otherwise some people look for it in some of their other pursuits like hobbies etc can you talk a little bit about how you've you found space for what you love uh, and maybe uh, you know uh, what element of the work for example really and the, and the barometer being what gives you energy right uh, what yes. really uh, yeah yeah so i think i do love my work so i think i'm one of those fortunate people uh, 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 but there are parts of my work that i love more than other of parts of my work uh, so for example um building a new product um uh, you know going to a new market um i think uh, this sort of build from scratch phase is incredibly exciting to me mm. um i uh i don't quite know why but uh, but i know that it is mm. um and uh, it's just the thrill of of creation uh, i think that uh, of something that was not already there um it's it's very fundamental uh, it's almost like giving birth to a new mm. life mm. Uh, and that uh, that is just fantastic uh, um, so and that part of the life of in i have absolutely uh, loved and they continue to be um uh you know a lot of new directions that we pursue uh which really gives me the energy uh for all the scale up hmm. and all the grunge work uh that's required raising money from investors <laughs> uh making sure that we are meeting uh our targets 
uh, all of that. Um, uh, you know, and some of these, uh, especially, you know, the raising money from investors is not at all fun. Um, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just just to be completely frank. <laughs> so, uh, so it's good to have a balance, uh, mm. right? Uh, uh, in your in your work, um, uh, I love to travel. I mm. think that's the other, uh, uh, you know, bit that I really enjoy. I love to do it with family, mm. uh, uh, but I also like to do it on my own. Um, uh, but I think that you know now we're coming to a stage where um, it's very easy mm. uh, to travel with family um, and. Uh, uh, you know, that's learning a new language while you're traveling. Uh, just love those experiences, uh, meeting new people. I'm a very social person. So uh, I like to sort of make friends wherever I go. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, of course, uh, I think reading books have been a friend. <laughs> for an incredibly long time and uh, thanks to the pandemic came back to reading uh, like on average uh, uh, a book a month mm. Um, mm. Uh, mm. which which actually had disappeared from my life and, mm. uh, uh, and it's great that it's back because it's like having a good friend uh, who's always with you mm. uh, my husband always says that being self-sufficient is very important, mm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, and sort of books uh, is is a way uh, to to just find happiness um, uh, in a very self-sufficient way. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and apart from that, uh, uh, yeah, I would say those are those are really. Uh, the main things that give me pleasure. Um, and the big piece I take away is, right, I think the a big chunk of what you love actually can be found at work, right? I think yes. I, I would say a very small, small minority find themselves in that point of privilege to say, you know, uh, you know, this, this element of, I agree, not everything around work is uh, joyful, but, but to even say that a big chunk of it is uh, energizing is a good place to be, right? I think that itself is a, yeah, is a yeah. privilege. It's it's a fabulous place to be. Correct. Uh, Correct. Yeah. The other theme I wanted to explore, Sucharita, was just uh, this notion of aspiration, right? Uh, in the book, uh, you know, one of the themes that I try to expand on is the distinction between ambition and aspiration. Ambition often ends up being unidimensional. I want to be a partner. I want to be an MD. I want to be this. Um but aspiration often can have multiple dimensions uh, given the various identities we carry, um, whether it's personal, professional, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm curious about how, where that is today and maybe uh, how that's sh the shape of your aspiration has evolved over the last few years. Would you, would you, uh, would you have a sense? Um, I think one aspect uh one aspect that I've been thinking about uh, mm. for a while is that um, our work has, uh, you know, huge relevance and huge impact, not just in India, but in uh, many other parts of the world, mm. uh, largely the global south, other mm. emerging markets, uh, but practically, you know, every single um country with a large proportion of workforce working in the informal sector has largely the same problems, mm. uh, sometimes even greater problems. Mm. And, uh, and I think uh, I feel like uh, it would be great to be able to um, extend our impact um, to other emerging markets where it's needed. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was reading some statistics that, you know, there are about 2 billion people working in the informal economy wow. uh, with pay slips. Uh, that's one fourth of the of world. Which, huh? Yeah, that's one fourth of the world and probably a little bit higher 
uh, when you look at working population mm -hmm. um, uh, as well. So, two billion people actually working in the informal economy. This is adults only. You look wow. at families; uh, it's probably larger, and uh, uh, you know, and 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 the thing is that informality. Um, is a growing trend even in the Western world. So if, when you look at countries like the US, um, many jobs have been Uberized uh, and mm. have gone from formal to informal. So it's actually mm. a very significant trend. Mm. But you know, giving uh, people ways in which uh, or the tools that they need to deal with this informality because with informality, you get flexibility, but you also uh, get huge amounts of volatility and huge amounts mm. of uncertainty. And how mm. do you cope with this mm. uh, when you actually have fairly fixed obligations uh, in terms of family um, and your responsibilities, rent, etc. Just, uh, you know, your life has many fixed obligations. So, uh, so that is definitely uh, an aspiration. Um, mm. uh, I, I do think that there is um, there are bits to do uh, and contribute uh, on uh, just the operational side, mm. uh, uh, you know, which could be done by Kaleidofin. But there are also other parts like enabling uh, digital public infrastructure. Uh, enabling, uh, uh, you know, regulations that make this happen faster mm -hmm. and needs to happen faster. I feel like also uh, a lot of, uh, you know, what we are experiencing today um, in terms of unsustainability, uh, unsustainable lifestyles, unsustainable enterprises leading to climate change um, also stems from this deep inequality um, which, as you know, has increased tremendously over the last decade. Um, but uh, the infrastructure, regulatory, digital, as well as operating companies that can provide these tools, none of these are making as much progress. So it feels like this, this is a place mm. uh, to do much more in, um, um, you know, but uh, but would love to brainstorm with mm. uh, you know with a bunch of people who have perhaps uh, you know their feet in several mm. different countries or continents. Um, um, so certainly that aspiration is there. I think the other aspiration, of course, is to do with the family and uh, uh, you know the girls. Uh, uh, you know, seeing them. Um, uh, being able to follow the path of uh, their dreams, whatever it is, uh, uh, at any point, uh, and uh, and to give them enough exposure so mm. that they make the right right choices um, mm. uh, for themselves. They're at a point where uh, I can actually talk about my work. Uh, it all makes sense now uh, to them. And, uh, uh, you know, and not just my work, but but in general, you know, expose them mm. uh, to various issues so that, you know, then they choose um, uh, what they want to do. But uh, but I think that, you know, this always, it, the, you know, this exposure has a funny way of coming back at some point of time uh, <laughs> in your life. Uh, and, you know, obviously you would want to achieve your first steps first. It's only natural. But, uh, uh, you know, sowing the seeds is important. It's a, it's a bit like you spoke about the subconscious, right? I think sometimes uh, these things get buried in the subconscious and as they take their make their choices, they may not be able to uh, put a finger on this, but uh, I'm sure it would inspire them to to make choices with this in their subconscious uh, as they move forward. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so I mean, hopefully with the impact can also fulfill the travel ambition <laughs> side by side. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, 
I think the other the other theme I wanted to explore was about just staying relevant, right? I think uh, I mean you briefly touched upon it, but uh, you pick up a bunch of skills as a banker, then you move to IFMR, which requires a different set of skills. Then you set up Kaleidofin. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the themes uh, I'm exploring is how people invest in their intangible balance sheet. And that could be things like health, things like vitality, things like capabilities. So, talk to us a little bit about. Just uh, what's been uh, some of the things you've been doing to nurture your intangible balance sheet? Yes. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, I think this is incredibly important. Uh, initially, I would say in my IFMR days, um, I would think uh, very simplistically that the more you push yourself, uh, the more you do and the better it is uh, for you and the ecosystem. But, uh, uh, but, but you know, as you grow older, uh, you realize that uh, uh, you know your own health and well-being is very important because um, because you're doing this for the long run. Yes, and uh, you're not doing a sprint; you're doing the equivalent of a marathon. So you need to pace yourself. Um, you need to invest in building muscle, uh, all of that, right? So, um, uh, so a few things that I'm doing differently uh, in the last five years, as compared to you know the previous decade uh, before that, is one. Uh, uh, you know, I've discovered that meditation is um, just. Um, very, very beneficial. Um, I'm, I think it's sort of, uh, for me, I'm wondering how to put it. Uh, it also connects you to your uh, mm. inner self. Uh, those moments of quiet that you have uh, enable you to think more clearly, have more energy, be more patient, um, uh, you know, with people, take a deep breath when things go wrong. Uh, so I think it's just life changing in so many different ways, very small ways, actually. But uh, I've incorporated a daily meditation practice. Is there a uh, certain form of meditation you do? Uh, just uh, maybe to yeah. understand. So uh, just a mindfulness meditation. Um, uh, but But I feel like I've also, you know, been able to appreciate uh, people with the uh, you know more spiritual mm. meanings mm. only because uh, you're somewhat exposed to it yourself at least at the borderline which is nice it's nice mm. to be able to understand someone else I, uh, I sort of you know uh, for many years of my life I felt like I did not understand religion at all or religion, spirituality, all of the above. Um, but now I feel like I understand it a bit more um, mm. and uh, or at least appreciate it a bit more. Um, and and uh, of course, I think fitness is incredibly important. You realize that you start creaking, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you can't eat what you feel like, you uh, can't put junk in your body uh, and uh, uh, your body is basically decaying <laughs> after a certain age and you have to make an effort. And again, uh, you know, just the rebound in energy levels that you see uh, mm -hmm. is... Um, uh, is is totally worth it. It's hard. It's really hard to do, um, and I'm constantly finding it hard. But uh, uh, you know, but I think there is a realization. But taking taking small steps towards that. So uh, and uh, and equally, I would say making time for things that you love, like reading, like mm -hmm. traveling. Uh, mm -hmm. Even those are. Uh, you know, extremely energizing. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, you know, I think for a decade, I, I didn't read much because I was just so busy with work and family. 
um and i think it's uh, it's beautiful to do something only for yourself hmm. not for anyone else not for your kids not for your colleagues not for work not for impact yeah, just absolutely like, <laughs> you just wear your oxygen mask right it's uh, it's yeah. a simple thing but it's so true uh, before yeah. uh, so uh, i think uh, i think there is a much deeper realization and i think overall just uh, you understand the value of patience and kindness hmm. uh, more than before uh, again it's a journey but uh, certainly much more than before which are just sort of mindful of time just coming up to the last piece right i think uh, the book and the series of conversations is about people who are deliberate about leading a full life and playing to full potential in a way that's the that's the theme i'm exploring so just if if i were to ask you for the purpose of the listeners distill the few things that emerge top of head uh, and who is playing to full potential again is debatable right to, to but but uh, let me let me make it easier for you to say people who are striving to play to their full potential uh, what's uh, what what would be some of the things uh, that come top of mind for you um i i believe it's about sort of taking steps uh in the right direction uh mm-hmm. i uh, i feel like striving to your full potential is too often uh misconstrued as a eureka moment and you mm. might find that it never came mm. um uh i actually find that there are very few eureka moments they just generally build over time mm. um until you just know it uh but it doesn't happen uh in one stroke of inspiration largely maybe it does to a few but i would be willing to bet <laughs> that you're much more likely to find it if you just keep chipping away in the right mm. direction um mm. uh, and uh, uh, stop looking for the eureka moment uh, mm. if it comes great um and uh, and i think also uh just uh, a sense of respect for yourself mm. uh, and what you need uh, to do in order to function well for your work for your family um i think that at the base of it if that is there uh you know because the path is different for different people um you will do the right things uh but uh, but i think uh, that not treating yourself like a machine uh mm. treating yourself with the respect that you deserve um i think very often just leads to better relationships right because otherwise uh, you could end up feeling um bitter hmm. or resentful hmm. um and none of those feelings are um are going to do any good to the relationships um uh, that that you're with um so uh so i think just recognizing what you need to do uh to respect yourself fully is also uh, required uh yeah and and i think trust your gut uh what you're feeling is far more powerful uh, than your rational mind so mm-hmm. don't ignore that <laughs> you know true, uh, true and what you feel is often accumulation of uh millions of moments of life right i think it sort of it's a culmination of micro experiences and uh correct you know judgments and uh, uh results got it lovely thank you so much for making the time sucharita uh sincerely appreciate it i learned a lot and uh, uh again it's it's inspiring when you meet people who you know rather than treating life as series of either or when when you meet people who've sort of tried to manage the and across the various dimensions that's inspiring so clearly you're one of them thank you for making the time no thank you so much uh entirely my pleasure and i so thoroughly enjoyed this conversation no. thank you two things struck me in this conversation with sucharita one is the point she makes about action often speaking louder than words 
This is something that came up in my podcast conversation with Professor Herminia Ibarra of London Business School. And she says that very often, we act our way into a new way of thinking rather than think our way into a new way of acting. The second thing that struck me was what she says about play to potential. She says that very often it's not one eureka moment, but it's a set of small things we do and set of micro choices we make that eventually helps us play to our potential. And suddenly you take these small steps and you realize that you've climbed a mountain. Sucharita is one of the six people we've featured in the book, Play to Potential, and we have videos on all six of them. If you're looking for actionable insights around doing inner work, shape-shifting from life quakes, and leading a multidimensional life, do consider picking up the book, Play to Potential, Lead a Full Life, Become the Best You. The details of where you can find the book is in the description section below. Thank you for listening. Thank you.